Welcome to our time of worship this morning. Please stand if you are able and join us in singing.
worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything. this morning these words from Psalm 24. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. Please take a few minutes to welcome those around you. Then I think you can be seated at this time as we join together in our morning prayer. Just one announcement uh, to share with you, and that is that Lloyd Elbers, as you read in your worship folder, underwent surgery earlier this week. He was readmitted to the hospital on Friday for heart failure, difficulty breathing. Uh, right now he's stable and hopes to return home today, but we certainly want to keep them in our prayers. Let's join together in our morning prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your holiness. You are holy other, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of our salvation, the creator of an eternal hope through the ministry of your spirit. 
And through the richness of your love and grace, you have sent your Son into this world to sacrifice for sin so that we would not only sing of your holiness, but so that we would be made holy and acceptable to you. Your grace is more than we could ever ask or imagine. And so this morning we thank you, we praise you, we worship and we adore you for that beautiful gift. And we pray this morning, Lord, that the splendor of your holiness, as we already heard in our welcome, will reach the ends of the earth. And that children, women, and men from every tribe and nation and people and language will be captivated by the vision of who you are. And that through the sacrifice of your Son, whether spoken through pastors or missionaries or through deeds of love and service, will see the splendor of being made holy by grace alone. And so, Father, we pray that the gospel that we celebrate week after week will once again revive our own hearts today and will be the gospel that reaches to the ends of the earth, and that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. Father, we pray for our community of faith called First Church, we lift up Larry and Mona Vanderzee and their children, Brandon, Abby, Sierra, Savannah, in the passing of their father and grandfather, Eugene Busman. We praise you, Lord, that you have delivered him from his suffering, and yet we pray that you will give to the Vanderzee family your comfort during this time of grief. Help all of us, help them to know that in life and in death, we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We lift up Henry and Adrienne de Cruyff, and we ask, O oh Lord, that you will continue to be with them as they receive their rehabilitation care at the Prince of Peace Rehab Center. We thank you for the faith that they exercise and give expression to every day. We lift up Lloyd and Deb Albers, Father, you know the journey he's been on, the multiple times that he's been diagnosed and has had to battle cancer and now with heart failure. Lord, we pray that you will give to him healing and strength and courage. And we pray that you'll give to Deb and, and to Lloyd together a sense of your peace and presence in this time of struggle. And we praise you for Sam Preheim, and his successful surgery in Iowa City this past week, already worshiping with us again this morning, filled with life and energy as a young six-year-old. Father, we praise you for what you have done in his life. And Father, these are just a taste of the many different people in our congregation. So many joys, so many needs. And Father, each of us is your child, and we ask that you will continue to show your holy love for your holy children through the gift of your holy Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we lift up this world in these interesting times. When we listen to the reports about hurricanes or tropical depressions and see the massive flooding that is taking place around the world, when we see the images of wildfires that is making it difficult for people to breathe and see the haze in our own air because of it. When we think of pandemics and the impact it has had on people in so many different ways. When we see the many other illnesses that still exist and snuff out human life as we experience the hostilities and racial tensions that are at work in the world today. And as we continue to hear of war and military buildup, Father, we recognize that life is vulnerable, that all of us are in desperate need of your holy grace. And we pray, Lord, that in the midst of all of these expressions of darkness and inhumanity and injustice. 
that you will be the God who is at work, softening hearts, opening ears and eyes to hear and see the kingdom, and then giving hearts that believe the good news. And so, Father, we pray that your glory will indeed be over all the earth. Be with us now as we give our offering, listen to your word, celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. What a great day you've given us. We thank you for it. Continue to remind us of who you are and what we've become because of you. In the great and beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, we've been doing our offering in many different ways lately. We can push a button on our phone right now through church center or whatever we call it. We can put it in a drop box. We can send it in by mail. Offerings are important. And as we'll learn in our scripture this morning, our whole life is to be an offering before the Lord. It's an act of worship, not just here, but it's an act of worship in our whole lives. And so while we're doing it the way we're doing it right now, I hope we never get used to that. And we see that the simple act of giving, physically giving something, is an important act of worship that reminds us of who we are before the Lord. Our offering today is for tuition assistance. You can see on the screen the many different ways. But as we think about our offering, let's sing the song, Jesus Messiah, the greatest offering the world has ever seen in his sacrifice on the cross. Let's stand and sing it. Blessed Redeemer, 
be seated. I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Last week we started listening to those words of Scripture. Romans 12, 1 and 2, we looked at it last week, today, and the next couple of weeks, and discovered the richness and the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our focus through this series is on obedience. Last week we looked at obedience as motivated by grace and the sacrifice of Jesus. Today we look at that theme of living sacrifices and what it means to be God's obedient children through that image. So Paul writes, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Will you bow in a word of prayer with me? Father, thank you for your word. And now we ask that you will open our ears to hear it, our minds to understand it, our eyes to see it, our hearts to believe it, our lives to live it. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Make us attentive to your truth so that Christ will be exalted within each of us. In the great and beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In a few moments, we will practice the words that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26. There he says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Paul is making a pretty simple point. He's saying that when we participate in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we don't just receive grace, but the sacrament has consequences for life. And that the faith we have in Jesus, the grace that we receive, the natural fruit is faithfulness. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you actively proclaim in word and deed the Lord's death until he comes. And you may ask, what does that proclaim look like? Our text says it looks like this. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. That's proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Living sacrifices. Last week I finished the message by making reference to John Stott. At the age of 99, in the last three weeks of his life, his friend paid him a visit, laying on a bed, unable to speak, completely unable to move in his weak condition. And his friend asked him the question, how would you like me to pray for you? And he gave that amazing answer, at least I think it's amazing, pray that I will be faithful to Jesus until my last breath. Can't move, can hardly speak. Pray that I will be faithful. And that is the essence of what it is to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is the essence of what it means to be a living sacrifice. 
It means to be faithful till our final breath. That the faith we hold, the grace we receive, bears the consequence, the fruit of a life of faithfulness to Jesus Christ. I've described faithfulness in many different ways to you, but there's two that are my favorite. When I think of faithfulness, I think of that phrase, faithfulness means that you stick with what you're stuck with. That's certainly the story of God's faithfulness to us. He sticks with broken, inhumane, sinful, weird people like you and me, right? He sticks with what he's stuck with. And the second thing I think of when I think of faithfulness is that faithfulness is like stubborn devotion. God sticks with what he's stuck with because he's stubbornly devoted to you and me through the blood of Jesus sacrificed on the cross. That even Jesus who cried out, Lord, why do I have to go through this? Is there any other way? Let this cup pass from me the stubborn devotion of the Father gave to His Son the ears of silence and nailed Him to the cross because He sticks with what He's stuck with. We look at faithfulness through the lens this morning of sacrifice. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now when Paul talks that way, the first sacrifice we need to look at is the sacrifice for sin. And before we even begin to apply this text to ourselves. We have to see its application to Jesus because Paul is, first of all, talking about a sin offering, right? And when he talks about a sin offering, the worshiper in the Old Testament, the people of Israel, would offer a sacrifice, the shedding of blood, to ask for forgiveness of sin. And the book of Hebrews makes the point that all of those Old Testament sacrifices point to the central and singular most important sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. In fact, in multiple different occasions in the book of Hebrews, it says Jesus was sacrificed once for all. Once for the past, the present, and the future. Once for all. That's a God who sticks with what he's stuck with and does it with a stubborn devotion. At some point, all of us have to ask a question. Why does God love me? What makes me acceptable to God? On what basis does he accept me? And then you come to a verse like Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that says, the wages of sin is death. Not only are we as good as dead in sin, but that's what we deserve is death. We don't deserve life. We don't deserve blessing. We don't deserve all the good things of God. And yet, the writer of Hebrews and the Apostle Paul, when they talk about living sacrifices and first go to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, say, but let's get back to basics here. Romans 6.23 is answered in the cross of Christ. He dies. He's undeserving of death, but he takes death so that we can have life. Or to say it in the spirit of Psalm 103, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. 
He's slow to anger. He's abounding in love. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed all of our sins from us. God doesn't love me because I'm lovable. And God doesn't accept me because I'm acceptable. God loves me because He is love and He accepts me because He is persistently and stubbornly devoted and sticks with what He's stuck with and He made you and He says, I love you and you are mine. Isn't that great? And I suspect, friends, let me just say this as a side note, that if we get tired of grace, if we get tired of talking about this uncompromising, stubborn graciousness of God, it's because we don't understand our sin and we don't understand His generosity. I am more sinful than I ever dared to imagine. And He is more loving than I ever dared to believe. And Paul is saying when we become living sacrifices, faithful to God, first take a good, hard look at the sacrifice of all sacrifices, Jesus Christ. It's good news, isn't it? Amen? But once you look at that, the sacrifice for sin, then the second theme is there is a sacrifice to God. Because not only were there sin offerings in the Old Testament, there were what was called the whole burnt offering, which this text also refers to. And the whole burnt offering is a reference to our attitude and to our disposition, our relationship to the Lord. You see, in the whole burnt offering, the worshipers brought their most valuable animal, one that was holy without blemish, In other words, it was the most expensive livestock that they had. And the purpose of bringing the most expensive livestock and have it sacrificed and completely consumed in the fire on the altar was to symbolize that everything I have belongs to the Lord and everything I have and am is at his disposal. And he doesn't get the leftovers, he gets the best and the first of everything of me and you. And not only that, but that offering was completely burnt to symbolize total consecration. It's not just I'll be a Christian on Sunday in church or a Christian when I pray with my family at a meal, but in everything I do, in the words I speak, everything I am, wherever I am, whatever I am, it's all God's. And it's a moment of holy consecration and service to Him. I wonder what that means for our attitudes. I wonder what that means if, like Stott, we say, I pray that I'll be faithful to Jesus until my last breath. One person recently said, you and I are living in an ABC moment. A moment in history that can be defined by those first three letters of the alphabet, ABC moment. What did he mean? ABC means this, anything but Christianity. That the historical moment in which we live, we are being endlessly told that Any idea, wild or wonderful or weird, any lifestyle, wild, wonderful or weird, any religious self-expression, wild, wonderful or weird, can be espoused and accepted unless it is Christian. Anything but Christianity. And if our ears are in tune with the voices of culture, We understand that. But at some point we have to ask the question, what historically has been the foundation for understanding the sanctity of life? 
What historically has been the foundation for advancing the dignity of personhood or advancing responsible freedom or seeking justice or equality or breaking down racial tension or seeking gender equality? In the midst of all of the hatreds, polarizations, and inequalities that define our day, And what has always historically made the impact for that kind of joy within cultures have been people, leaders, and churches that have understood that everyone is made in the image of God and Jesus was sacrificed to restore that image in every child, every woman, every man. And then this man said, that is not just our ABC moment to rediscover that. But then he asked the question, will we have an ABC faith? A faith that responds to the moment as living sacrifices, faithful and holy and pleasing to God. And what did he mean by ABC faith? He meant this, all about Christ. All about Jesus Christ. And that my mind and my attitude and my demeanor and my approach to life is Christ and Christ alone. Makes me think of Martin Luther who was being encouraged to recant this teaching of salvation by grace through faith alone through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And he said, unless I am convinced by scripture and plain reason, I do not accept the authority of the popes and the councils My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor is it safe. God help me. Amen. Is that our ABC faith in this ABC moment? And when I listen to the voice, That says marriage is whatever you want it to be. That sex is whatever you want it to be. That religion is whatever you want it to be. That religious freedom should be curtailed. When I listen to those kind of challenges, then my question is always, can we say with Luther, but here I stand. Here I stand on the truth of God's word, the restoration that grace brings, the dignity of humanity that can only be found through the sacrifice on the cross. Here I stand. And not by the faddish and passing stuff that goes under the name of relevance today. What I do know is this, it is only about the Word of God and it is only about Jesus Christ that is said the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen? Living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And so there's not just a sacrifice for sin and a sacrifice to God, but friends, let me finish with this. There is the sacrifice of yourself. We are a living sacrifice. And if you go to the Greek, it means we are a living killing. It means in the Greek we should be killed every day in the name of Jesus. I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And then he says that your body should be living sacrifices. Well, what is Paul saying there? Well, back in the day when Paul was around, bodies were perceived as bad and not to be taken as important. What was important was the mind. And Paul is saying, yes, we have to receive it in our minds, but the faith that we have is lived out in our physical bodies. 
And the sacrifice of Jesus that changes our attitudes gets lived out in our everyday conduct. If you go to Romans 3, he defines our sin this way. Our tongues practice deceit. Our lips spread poison. Our mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Our feet are swift to shed blood. Our eyes turn away from the Lord. And our arms do not embrace the lonely or the unloved, but hold them at a distance. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and because we are living sacrifices... He says in Romans 6 and Romans 12 through 16 these words, Tongues bring healing. Lips speak truth and spread the gospel. Feet will walk in the paths of Jesus Christ. Eyes will see with the heart of Christ and look humbly and patiently toward all people. And the hands will lift up the fallen. And Paul is saying, look at your body, look at your life, and ask how it's being used in the name of Jesus. And I sometimes wonder, in today's culture, in today's world, what would be the impact if Christians led the way in the pathway of hope by simply being a living sacrifice? And saying, I will have the eyes and the ears and the lips of Jesus. What would happen with all the hostilities and difficulties that we face today, both in the church and in culture and in the world? Not that we're the Messiah, that we can change everything. But what would happen if we said, whatever the cost... That's who I will be. That's who we will be. What I do know is this. That the Apostle John, in this same spirit, said, Greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. Paul finishes up by saying, This is your true and proper worship. And that simply means true and proper in the Greek. This is rational. This is just the way believers think. It may not make sense to a lot of other people, but when you start thinking about the faith and you see the fruit in your own life, in other people's lives, about the meaning of grace, this is rational. And then we might say, well, how can we do this? Jesus was the sacrifice. How can I have this stand with Luther? Here I stand, I can do no other. How can I be this living sacrifice? I'm not that strong. And you're right, you're not. And I'm not. But don't forget that when Jesus came to earth, The Bible goes to great pains to show us that everything Jesus did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit and according to the Word of God. He didn't do it on his own strength. And that great confession the Heidelberg Catechism says to us that we share in the anointing of the Holy Spirit with Jesus Christ and we live according to his word. We do not live in our own strength, but we live in Christ. And we are able to fix our eyes on the sacrifice of Christ. And we are able to be the living sacrifice. And we can give ourselves Because greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. And so what is faithfulness? God sticks with what he's stuck with through the stubborn devotion of his son on the cross. Is he asking us too much to emulate that? To stick to him? Be stubbornly devoted as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God? I'll let you answer that question when you eat the bread and drink the cup 
whether we will together proclaim the Lord until he comes. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you so much for your good and gracious word. And we thank you that you have made us a living sacrifice through the sacrifice of your son. And we thank you that the privilege of obedience is not an obedience that is a duty and a drudgery, but is the joy of seeing Jesus and the privilege and the gratitude of emulating him. Help us to bear the fruit of grace in this your great world for the glory of your name in all the earth. In the good and beautiful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Come to the altar as we prepare to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And if you're a guest with us today, we're first of all glad you're here. 
and uh, all those who confess Jesus Christ as their only Lord and Savior, who are truly sorry for all of their sins, and who seek to live a life of obedience to him, are welcomed by the Lord himself to this, his table of grace. And hopefully, uh, when you walked in, you received one of these cute little cups. It's got the bread on the bottom and the juice on the top, and uh, we'll give you instructions as we go along. But Jesus took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. And he also took the cup and he poured it. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant, the blood that has been poured out for you. Take it and drink it in remembrance of me. And as Paul said, when you eat the bread and when you drink the cup, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim what he's accomplished. You proclaim what he's doing today. And you proclaim the hope of the nations for tomorrow. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the privilege to come to this table. A table that represents the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace that is given for every child, woman, and man from every tribe and nation and language where you are gathering your children, not only to nourish our faith, but to lead us in faithfulness, to proclaim the good name to all the earth. So nourish our faith, equip us for faithfulness. In the good and beautiful name of Jesus, we pray, amen. So if you take your cups and you peel the bottom, you will find a wafer. And Jesus said, take, eat, remember, and believe that my body was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sin. And then you can turn it around and peel back for the juice. And Jesus said, take and drink and remember and believe that my blood was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sin. I made reference to Psalm 103 already, but David writes, Praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. For as far high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise the Lord all his works, everywhere in all his dominion, Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. We always have a communion offering. And today the communion offering is for the needs of the family. The way we're going to do that today is there will be four deacons at the back. Uh, and you can put your communion offering in the bag there. And uh, that is the way we can show our gratitude to the Lord. Needs of the family is a benevolence fund through which we help those who are in need. As you're thinking about that communion offering, we give thanks to God by standing and singing, Lamb of God.
Raise your hands with me to receive God's parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. May he go before you to lead you. May he go behind you to guard you. May he go beneath you to support you. And may he go beside you to befriend you. But friends in Jesus, do not be afraid. Let the blessing of our living God come upon you today as you go in peace and as his living sacrifice to love and to serve our living God. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you.